Hello and welcome again. It's not cup of coffee. It is my crime programs, uh, either invitation to the Black Museum or inside the Black Museum. I've had so many requests of people saying, Sandy, where are your crime programs? We just don't see them anymore. So I have decided it's time again to share the snippets of the programs. Uh, there were 15 of them that I filmed. They are all real crimes and the artifacts are still sitting in the crime museum, which is not open to the general public. So this is the only way you can really see them. And I would say just sit back, relax, knowing that my cameras were the only ones that were allowed in to the museum. So you are sharing a little bit of what I shared. Take care and enjoy. New Scotland Yard, London, England, an address that is known worldwide. Headquarters of the Metropolitan Police, guardians of the capital city against crime. In the Marwood lobby, an eternal flame burns in memory of those members of the civil staff who have given their lives in both world wars. Together with a book of honor, in which is recorded the names of police officers who have lost their lives in the course of duty. And in a quiet corner of the building, a place where legend becomes fact that I would like to tell you about. But it is for the deputy commissioner to invite you in. Here in the yard is one of the police museums that many have heard of, but few have visited. It's an unusual museum and started life in 1875 when it was decided to keep certain items of property seized in connection with crime to instruct the young detectives of the then relatively new detective department of Scotland Yard. It was not too long before the press gave this collection of somewhat macabre artifacts the unofficial title of the Black Museum. And so it's remained over the years exhibiting the darker side of human nature instructing the professional policeman and the lawyer and intriguing the layman by its very name and remoteness. We've never opened the doors of the Black Museum to the general public and all visits have been by way of invitation and always highly prized. The exhibits range from the apparently insignificant to the spectacular and from the hardly known to the infamous whose names are known throughout the world. They have in common one thing supreme importance to the history of crime and the criminal, as you will see. The butcher's knife and sharpening stone used by mass murderer Dennis Nielsen to dissect his victims with a skill learned during his service as an army cook. The bath in which he cleansed his victims after death, then dismembered and disemboweled them. The stove and pots which he used to separate flesh from bone for disposal, particularly the heads. Both bath and stove stood in the murderer's apartment in a house in Cranley Gardens, North London and it was the simplest of household problems that gave him away. A blocked drain. The plumber that came to clear it climbed down the 12 feet to the bottom to discover that the blockage was caused by pieces of flesh. Human flesh. The police were called. At 5.40pm on Wednesday, the 9th of February, 1983, a detective chief inspector was just inside the front door of number 23 Cranley Gardens, awaiting the return of the murderer. In his own words, as I heard footsteps approaching and a key in the door, I wasn't sure what to expect, or even what my first words would be. What I wasn't expecting was the young, rather scholarly man standing before me. I said, are you Dennis Nielsen? He said, yes. I said, I'm a police officer. I've come about the drains. He looked almost relieved and said, you'd better come upstairs. Nielsen took the inspector and two other detectives to the bedroom and pointed to the wardrobe. Inside were two black plastic rubbish bags and inside those more smaller carrier bags. 
In one, the right side of a man's chest with the arm still attached. In another, the left side. In yet another, a torso. Are we talking about one body or two? asked one of the detectives. Fifteen or sixteen, said Nielsen. I'll tell you everything. And tell them he did. How he invited young men back to his home, sometimes for a drink, sometimes a meal, sometimes for sex, sometimes all three. How he used this tie and knotted string to garrote one victim. How these stereo headphones were placed on another and then the flex pulled tight. Nielsen afterwards donned them and sat listening to the music, the body of his victim slumped on the floor. And nearly always he dragged the naked body of his victim to the bath, in his own words, to cleanse it, before sharpening this knife on the stone and to begin dismembering. Using the cooking pots on the stove to boil and render down the more difficult pieces. At the Central Criminal Court in the Old Bailey on Friday, the 4th of November, 1983, Dennis Andrew Nilsson was found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with the recommendation he should serve not less than 25 years. As he was driven away in a prison van to begin his sentence, he tore the tape off the window so that all could see the man who had killed 15 times. Seemingly, his only regret, the death of his dog Bleep, constant companion, and silent witness to his crimes. Bleep's collar rests as a token exhibit in the Black Museum.